Um, before we get too far into it, I wanted to just let folks know that the meeting is being recorded for uh, posterity and it'll be posted on our rezoning website for folks to refer to who may not be able to join us tonight. Um, but I want to thank everyone for joining us this evening to talk about this proposed rezoning of the Greater Scotts Edition neighborhood. Uh, my name is Will Omquist. I'm a planner here with the city in the Department of Planning and Development Review. Just wanted to start by acknowledging um, some of my colleagues that are going to be on the meeting with us tonight. We have uh, Kevin Vock is our acting director of the department. We also have Maritza Peachin. She was the Richmond 300 master plan update project manager, and now she is um, leading the implementation of the plan as the deputy director of the Office of Equitable Development. Um, she'll be speaking a little bit about the plan in reference to uh, this neighborhood. We still have a lot of folks joining us. Thanks everyone for, for joining. We're just getting started now. Um, we also have a few other folks um, that are here in the Department of Planning and Development Review. Um, I'm going to help with the meeting tonight and going to help answer questions afterwards. Um, I um, already mentioned Maritza. We have Marianne Pitts, Yesenia Revilla, Emily Routman, um, Rich Saunders as well. So uh, there's a team of folks here that are going to help us through this process. Um, so basically, Tonight, we're hoping to outline some of the basic ideas about this rezoning and what that would mean for uh, current property owners, uh, future uh, property owners and uses in the neighborhood. Um, we're going to spend probably about 20 or 30 minutes on an introductory presentation talking about the rezoning and the plan, the Richmond 300 plan that's informing this rezoning. And then we're going to leave a lot of time at the end for questions and answers. Uh, attendees are muted um, at the moment, um, so we're going to save questions for the end, but you're welcome to type your questions into the chat and they will be um, they'll be read at the end of the meeting um, interspersed with Q&A as well. Um, the PowerPoint presentation that we're going to give tonight is already posted on the on the rezoning website. So if you're having a hard time seeing some of the visuals on the screen that I'm sharing um, through the Microsoft Teams platform, you can just go ahead and download that that PDF um, from the website. Um, I think the the address should have been provided on those postcards and sent around as well. You can also just search um, uh, City of Richmond rezoning and you can find it that way. It's also under the um, RVA.gov and then planning development reviews website too. So there's a few different ways of finding it, hopefully. Um, so to kick things off, I'm going to hand things over to Maritza Peachin. She's going to give some background information about the Richmond 300 plan and um, also the Greater Scots Edition uh, framework plan. And uh, this is kind of the plan that's um, driving the vision behind the rezoning. So this background will help inform um, and explain some of the ideas that we're going to be presenting a little bit later on. So take it away, Maritza. Thank you, Will. Hi, everybody. Um, for some people, this may be a, a repeat. You've been involved. I see a lot of names that I recognize uh, in the group. Uh, I see Catherine Jordan, the council person for a good portion of this area, is on the call. Thank you for joining us. Um, and so this might be a repeat for a lot of you, but the one thing that we learn when we're doing planning is that um, there's always new people moving to the city and there's new people who don't know the context of how we got to where we are. So I'm going to give an overview of the big master plan elements that kind of led us to here. So in, the, in big context, Richmond is growing. It's added a lot of people over the last 20 years. It's very significant growth. People who've been in Richmond for a long time haven't experienced this kind of growth. Uh, Richmond has essentially been declining in population since 1950. The 1970 increase was only because we annexed Chesterfield. The city would have continued to lose population um, if we hadn't annexed the, that, those 20 acres of Chesterfield. Um, we don't know how much we're going to grow but we know that um, that we want to plan for growth so that it is 
uh, equitable, sustainable, and beautiful and helps complement the wonderful places that exist in our city today um, and, and makes new places for people to live in that, that no one has lived in before. So Greater Scott's Edition is sort of like this area around the diamond is, is one of those places. Um, go ahead, next one. And so the Richmond 300 plan was a is a place-based integrated approach to guiding investment in the city and it starts with a citywide vision and there's three big maps i'm going to touch on three sets of maps that i'm going to touch on and then we have five topic visions with 17 goals 70 objectives and 411 strategies it's a big document comprehensive plans usually are um, so if you go to the next one we have the vision for the city and that is Richmond is welcoming, inclusive, diverse, innovative, and equitable city of thriving neighborhoods, ensuring a high quality of life for all. That whole for all part is um, is driving more at that, that equity piece uh, that has become kind of more and more important in the general discourse of our country and of our city. Um, and is something that we want to see lived throughout our development as we continue to grow as a city. So if you look at the next area, we have one of our maps are these nodes, and these are priority growth nodes. I want to I want to point out that there's a lot of other nodes in the city. Um, this doesn't mean that this is the only place that places that that the city will grow. Um, there's growth happening in Northside as people, you know, build houses on empty lots and fix up old houses that have been abandoned for a long time. There's growth happening in lots of other parts of the city. Um, these priority growth nodes are just um, some of the places that either are experiencing a lot of growth or um, kind of are poised because of their position like Southside Plaza um, to to potentially experience more growth and be rethought of over the next 20 years. One thing to remember is that the master plan is a 20 year plan. There's no way that any of this stuff is all going to happen um, in one year or even five. Um, and not all of it will occur over the 20 years. Some of some things might take more time to accomplish in the plan. So the nodes are kind of an integral part of the plan. They're places that are places of interest, um, places where there's already a lot of energy. You know, there's usually businesses there. There might be housing. Um, it's usually a crossroads of major streets. Um, and you'll see if you look at the master plan, the nodes are referenced um, in, in a number of different ways. And the next slide sh shows how the future land use um, supports those nodes. A lot of times uh, the nodes are focuses for more mixed use activity um, because we're looking at connecting all of these nodes with with transit, greenways, better pedestrian infrastructure and improved roadway connections. Um, the master plan suggests future land use. Future land use is not zoning. What we are talking about today is zoning. That's the legal thing you're allowed to do with your property. Um, future land use is more visionary about like how we want places to transform and become. Um, so it's kind of an intermediate, intermediate, an intermediary tool that planners use to like vision places before um, rezonings or infrastructure changes occur. And the next slide shows how all these different connections and how um, all the nodes will be connected. And if you've noticed and you kind of have looked, I should have pointed it out before where Greater Scott's Edition is. Um, if you like, you can see that all of these circles, um, all these lines and in transportation infrastructure kind of start to make that be an important spot within the city. Um, and part of it is the fact that it's right next to I-95 and I-64, which is already a huge um, transportation network through the city. So where the, as I said before, the master plan has 411 strategies, which is a very large amount to get our hands around. And so these six big moves are, are kind of the my office's priorities to push forward. I say that with an asterisk because there are other things within the plan that aren't within these six that are very important and that we are also kind of tracking. Um, but one of them, as you see, is reimagine priority growth nodes. And that's part of what we're doing today is launching that with the Greater Scotts Edition rezoning. But you'll also notice that expanding housing opportunities, providing greenways and parks for all are also parts of our big moves. And as we think about the future of Greater Scotts Edition, there, we can also advance 
the priorities of expanding housing opportunities and providing more parks and greenways for the city. Um, so it's you by thinking about the future of this area, we can hit on multiple aspects of the goals for the for our city that are established in the master plan. So here's the Scott's edition priority growth node. Um, we uh, did some public meetings and engagement during the master plan process. Um, we collected nearly a thousand surveys where we asked people for their vision and their, you know, what they wanted this place to be like. Um, and then we, and then we did a, a version of the framework plan um, and got comments on that as well. So that part of part of the process of developing the framework plan for Scott's edition, which is included in the master plan, um, which was adopted by council in December, is of kind of thinking about how do we make Greater Scotts Edition more of an extroverted place, a place that like brings people in, um, not like a bunch of, you know, interior focused uh, events. Um, wanting to be able to introduce a variety of housing types to this area, using open space as a really strong convening uh, element uh, for, for gathering, um, and also uh, realizing that this location, Greater Scotts Edition, this site, really the diamond site that the city owns, um, represents an opportunity to meet the needs of the local Richmond population, but also be a regional attraction, um, given that the, that the squirrels are here um, and that we can continue to like be a regional attraction, bring in people from outside of the city who will stay, hopefully, and spend money and enjoy time um, in the Greater Scotts Edition area, you know, they go to the ballpark, but then they do other things, not just go to a baseball game and get in their car and go back home, uh, but they make a longer uh, trip of the area. So, and we also knew that we wanted to have residential here because if the city is going to continue to grow, um, providing those housing types and making a livable neighborhood um, that provides the destination amenities, but also has things that make a great neighborhood as well. So the next slide shows um, outlines the vision. It's a lot of words. It's in the master plan, um, but I kind of already covered most of what I just said, uh, what I said previously. So I'm not going to read you the vision. You can look it up in the master plan, which is available on the city's website. Next slide. This is current Scott's edition. Um, we did some analysis and we about 458 acres are of land or vacant or, un, or underdeveloped. Underdeveloped means that the, um, I'm going to mess this up well, that the land is worth more than the structure. Um, and so it's higher potential for someone to come and want to redevelop the land or redevelop the structure. Go ahead. So this is a, an image of what this Greater Scotts Edition area could look like with this Crescent Park, uh, like, kind of coming through the area uh, with a, a landmark bridge connecting Lee Street to the Crescent Park um, with, a, with a ballpark uh, for the squirrels, potentially VCU as well. Um, VCU is planning an athletic campus, so you can see the, the athletic campus there as well. Um, these are just kind of rendered ideas, I mean, of, of what this area could look like uh, in the future. Obviously, the part that the city owns, which is the, that central triangle, um, the city has a little bit more control over what, what that ends up looking like. Um, the other parts would be uh, redeveloped by or could be redeveloped if property owners so chose to do so um, and, and help build out this part of town. Next slide. This is the diamond currently. And if you go to the next one, um, you can see what it could look like in the future um, in that standing in that Crescent Park with development right alongside of it. And um, if you go to the next one, you can see what the Arthur Ashe looks like today and what it looks like, what it could look like in the future. Um, and this is just, you know, the development potential, what we could do on this street um, is, is possible because there is a big green space right behind it. Um, and so those two pieces kind of complement each other very strongly. Um, to, and the green space can help m manage stormwater, reduce the heat island effect, um, as well as creating great recreational amenities for, for the region, not just for the people who are here, who live here. 
So the next slide um, shows this framework, the, the framework plan, these different districts. Um, you'll see the letter A, it's, we're calling that gateway district. I mean, these are placeholder names. I know that some folks have gotten, um, you know, have talked about Greater Scotts Edition being uh, not the right name. And, and we just created, we needed to be able to refer to this area somehow. And so that's what we called it. And actually we learned talking to our historic preservationist on staff that this area was owned by um, Scott. Like that's why we call it Scott's edition because it belonged to Scott, the Scott family. So even the part where the diamond is was also owned by, by the Scott family way back when. But as you can see, it's a huge area and each place is probably gonna end up getting its own name over time. Um, and, and I know that names really matter. Um, but I, I think the Greater Scots Edition name right now is more of a placeholder, um, and in the future it'll have a it'll have a different name um, as these this area gets developed and it becomes more of a place um, that people are coming to. So each one of these districts has slightly different descriptors, and if you look in the master plan, there's different uh, inspirational images from other cities of how those places could evolve and could could look over time. Um, and one thing to talk about here too is transportation. Um, you'll see that there's the Pulse Corridor on Broad Street, but we also um, recommend, you know, a higher frequency bus. And you know, this could be a bus that comes every 15 minutes. It doesn't have to be a BRT that could um, kind of loop through the community um, and also connect into existing bus routes. There's already a bus route um, that goes down. Uh, Robin Hood and takes you to uh, east to the north side and then there's one that goes up Hermitage and takes you north kind of up to Lakeside. So um, we would envision this area to be connected really well to our transport, our transit infrastructure, as well as providing um, improved bike access and um, better pedestrian amenities. So the future land use designation that we created in the master plan um, puts us into two different areas. So you'll see in the dotted line is the area that we're looking at for the rezoning. Um, industrial mixed use to the west of North Arthur Ashe Boulevard. Um, destination mixed use in the triangle um, that's brown and then industrial mixed use to the east of Hermitage. Um, we have those as industrial mixed use because that's what Scott's edition is today. Um, that's what it was. Uh, that was the designation that it had in the Pulse Corridor plan. Um, and so we felt that since these areas are kind of pretty in industrial today, that 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 category made sense. Um, if you go to the next slide, you'll see kind of some imagery that we created in the master plan. There are two page spreads that describe each one of these categories. Um, destination mixed use is kind of a place that we would think of like uh, a, a downtown outside of downtown living buildings generally five stories tall not always sometimes there might be shorter buildings um, reaching up to 12 stories um, and and trying to it's called destination because it's a place that people from outside of the immediate neighborhood would want to be coming to um, from our greater region or from you know national tourists coming to town um, and the next slide shows a description of industrial mixed use, um, which is the formerly traditional industrial areas that are kind of converting um, and now are allowing residential and the warehouses are getting changed up, but then there's still a glass blowing company or there's still um, a breweries, of course, is a popular one, but there's other um, kind of light industrial uses. Uh, mixed into the neighborhood. It's not purely uh, residential, um, but it ha and it, the, the unique part being that it has some industrial. So the next slide um, is why are we rezoning Scott, Greater Scotts Edition? It's because in order to, to achieve the vision that I just shared with you, um, we have to rezone the property to allow um, uses that, would, that we're envisioning for the area, the residential, um, the higher, the, the greater height, um, the way that buildings address the street to create pedestrian uh, environments that are that encourage people to walk because they have things to look at because the buildings on the ground floor have something interesting happening on them um, because there aren't a lot of curb cuts like 
driveway entrances that they have that they have to pass through all the time um, because there's street trees because there's um, ample sidewalk space um, and so some of those things get determined with zoning and some of those things get determined through a uh, good street design in conjunction with uh, DPW, the Department of Public Works, and um, and implementing their Better Streets Manual. Um, so the current zoning doesn't align, doesn't achieve that vision for the future of Greater Scotts Edition. Um, we have had some SUPs coming in. Those are special use permits where people ask for a special exception to zoning um, to do something different. Um, and we we anticipate and we've had a couple of rezonings and we anticipate that that trend would probably continue and so let's 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 just rezone and make it uh make the vision be like happen um the other pros part, part is that the city owns 60 acres in the middle of this um and to make a better uh rfp request for proposals um ask to get development community interested in this area it, it's better for the community to rezone the property so that developers know what the community wants um, and can propose things that are in alignment with uh, community uh, aspirations um, the the master plan talks about elements of like affordable housing and public open space and different things that we would want to fold into the rfp um, so that that's kind of a separate thing it's not related to the rezoning um, but those are things that because the city controls the land the city can um, can request certain community benefits uh, that to make to help uh, help us achieve a more equitable sustainable and beautiful Richmond over the next 20 years so will I think you're up next yeah uh, thanks Marisa um... It's a lot of good background information so folks can understand um, kind of where we're coming from, um, some of the inspiration for the rezoning and how the rezoning will be a tool to uh, to reach the future that um, the residents and the community have um, expressed throughout the planning process and that uh, is encapsulated in the Richmond 300 plan. Uh, this map shows the existing zoning as of today. Um, and I just want to ask, can you all see my mouse if I move it around? If I yes. try to point the things? OK, great. So the center of uh, the area is M1, light industrial. Um, and then we have two areas of M2, heavy industrial, to the northwest of Arthur Ashe, and then in the southern portion. We also have um, a few parcels that have been rezoned to B5 Central Business through a um, property owner's request, as well as a, a property owner who just, I think, last week was rezoned to TOD1 um, here at the railroad tracks in Arthur Ashe. Um, you can also see some of the SUPs, the special use permits that have been approved since 2010 in the neighborhood. And then the existing land use. So um, how the land is actually used today, the purple is industrial. So you can see, you know, a vast majority of the neighborhood is industrial with um, some commercial in the red, some um, kind of recreational open space kind of uses in the green, and also um, where we had the B5 rezonings and the SUPs approved, some multifamily that's starting to appear um, over here on Overbrook. This is just the, the future land use map again. So this is the very broad um, aspirational land use ideas that the zoning is kind of based on. Um, destination mixed use in the center between Arthur Ashe and Hermitage and industrial to the northwest, industrial mixed use to the northwest and the southeast. So this just kind of reiterates uh, what Maritza was saying before, how um, the existing zoning and the future land use are are not compatible in this area. The M1 and M2 that the majority of the of the area are zoned um, do not allow dwelling units at all by use. So there's no residential uses allowed by right. <clears throat> also limits the height of buildings to 45 feet. And um, as Maritza was talking about, the industrial mixed use and destination mixed use land use categories envision um, obviously a, a better mix of uses with multifamily residential being one of them, 
um, heights of three to eight stories in industrial mixed use, and then a minimum typically of five stories in destination mixed use. So this map shows what we're proposing tonight. Um, this is just kind of a first stab um, and a conversation starter with the community and the property owners. Um, this is kind of our what we think would work for the area and what is based on the new Richmond 300 master plan. You can see in the northwest um, where it was M2, we are proposing B7 mixed use business and I'll, we'll get into the nuts and bolts of some of these of these districts in just a second. Uh, TOD1 transit oriented nodal in the center between um, Arthur Ashe and Hermitage as well as the property that was rezoned to TOD1 by the petitioner's request. And then in this section um, to the east of Hermitage, we want to hear back from you all about whether you think uh, the B7 mixed use district or the B5 central business district would be a better fit for, for the property owners and for the future of the area. Um, we'll explain some of the differences between those two districts, but that's kind of a question mark currently. And we want to hear back from people about how they feel about the pros and cons between those two different districts. So this chart has a lot of information. I'm going to I'm going to break it down, um, try to make it as simple as, as possible. Um, there's a lot more information people can refer to to understand these districts a lot better, but these are kind of the broad brush um, descriptions of these zoning districts. So M1 and M2 are the two existing zoning districts in the area for the most part. M1 is light industrial. It allows um, all the uses that are allowed in the B3 district. So a lot of like um, anything from businesses to services to car washes and car repairs, uh, but not residential. It limits heights, heights of buildings to 45 feet. It doesn't really have any requirements for front yards. It has no really form requirements or special urban design features to make an area um, design better. And parking is based on the square footage of the uses. M2 is very similar, the heavy industrial. It allows everything that was in uh, the M1 district, but also allows for um, even heavier industrial uses, except for a certain select number of like very noxious uses. Um, and then same same deal with the height and the parking um, and lack of um, urban design requirements. The B7 light industrial district or uh, mixed use district is um, pretty much the best fit for mixed use uh, industrial type of land uses. It allows for a variety of retail and service and distribution of kind of a lesser degree, so not heavy industry, but smaller scale, less um, obtrusive. It allows for dwelling units and it allows for uh, uses that are allowed in the M1 and the M2 that are already existing at the time of a rezoning. So any any uses that are there already that would be allowed in the M1 and M2 can continue to stay um, in the B7 district. It allows for five stories in most cases. Uh, there's a maximum 10 foot front yard, so buildings can't be any further than 10 feet away from the street. <clears throat> uh, it has special requirements for fenestration, which means windows, so you have to have a certain amount of windows on the buildings, uh, the new buildings, and requirements for the location of parking and driveways, so you don't have parking lots um, in the front of buildings. You have parking lots behind buildings and driveways can't always be at the main street. Um, has to be maybe a side street access. Uh, parking is one per residential unit. Commercial is based on square footage and there's also a 50% reduction um, in the parking required for existing buildings. The B5 central business district that we're also considering for the area to the east of Hermitage Road um, allows for a similar mix of retail and service uses and dwelling uses. Um, it doesn't allow for the light industrial kind of uses though. Um, similar situation with a five-story maximum height, similar requirements for urban design, but much less um, parking required. So no parking is required for a residential project that has fewer than 16 dwelling units and then above 16 there's a requirement 
uh, of one space per four dwelling units. The TOD1 zoning district that we're envisioning for the area uh, between Arthur Ashe and Hermitage Road allows for a similar mix of uses as the B5, so uh, service, retail, residential. It allows much more height, up to 12 stories by right. Has similar requirements for urban design, windows, and that type of thing. Um, requires a little more parking, but still no parking required for a residential project below 16 units. And then above 16 units, there's a one per two unit requirement. And similarly, um, requirements for commercial parking is based on the square footage. Now, these are all the uses by district. I'm not going to read every single one, but I want them. I wanted them in the PowerPoint just so folks could see them and refer to them later. Um, just to give an idea of, of the types of actual uses that are allowed by right in these districts. So in the M1 district that currently exists um, in the area, it allows all the uses allowed in the B3 except dwelling uses. It allows for um, light industrial uses to a certain extent. It allows adult entertainment establishments. It allows parking lots. And then by conditional use, which means it has to get approval by uh, city council still, would allow for nightclubs, uh, retail sales of liquor, if um, if ABC, Virginia ABC was, uh, was privatizing liquor distribution, it could allow for those sales. These are all the B3 uses that would be allowed in the M1, that are allowed in the M1 district. Uh, you can see it's everything from catering and breweries to um, self-service car washes, motor fuel dispensing, marinas, uh, you know, all kinds of stuff that probably is no longer compatible with the vision that we have for, for this um, larger area within the city. M2 is very similar, so it allows for all those uses, but it also um, allows for uh, much more noxious uses. Um, some would require approval by city council, but um, it's a much heavier industrial type of district. This is the B7, kind of the mixed use industrial oriented type um, districts. Uh, it allows for those kind of service uses, residential, like I said, also, you know, wholesale warehouse distribution, um, lighter degrees of, of um, industrial uses, uses permitted in the M1 and M2 that are existing at the time of the rezoning are also allowed. Conditional use permit it um, allows for other uses too, um, but those would have to be approved by, by City Council. B5 Central Business District, um, you know, fewer number of uses, uh, service, retail, residential, some uses that could be allowed by conditional use permit. And then finally, the TOD1 district, um, pretty much the same uses as the B5 with a few different exceptions, but still kind of that, um, you know, service, retail, business, uh, residential mix, a couple uses allowed by conditional use permit. So those are kind of uses and, um, you know, design considerations that these districts would um, provide. Another component of the rezoning is um, these two different street designations. Currently, um, we have two different street designations that we use to help improve the urban design of, of areas. One's called Street Oriented Commercial. That's shown in the red. It's already existing um, by a prior rezoning of Scott's Edition along Broad Street and Arthur Ashe and Silva Railroad tracks but we're proposing it to extend up Arthur Ashe uh, to 95. And basically that requires um, one third or a thousand square feet of a, um, of a new development to provide another kind of use besides just residential. So like it needs to have kind of like an office maybe along the street or, res or um, retail, something that kind of enlivens the street. It's not just, um, you know, uh, apartment units with the blinds closed and no activity really going on. So we use that to try to, you know, en enliven a street 
um, in this case, Arthur Ashe. Um, we also have the priority streets in the blue. You can see the existing here, and then the proposed priority streets on Arthur Ashe, Hermitage, Sherwood, and Overbrook. Uh, Sherwood and Overbrook are the two roads that connect through underneath the highway. Basically, what Priority Street does, it kind of makes the street treated more uh, more as a principal street. Um, so if a building's at the corner, you have to acknowledge um, kind of both streets and not just only focus on one street that you might have your front door on and not have to do anything special on the other side street. Um, basically, it's saying these other streets are important as well. You need to have um, you know, driveways cannot be off these streets if there's another access point. Uh, parking decks and hotels need to have some other use wrapped around them, similar to the street-oriented commercial, to help enliven the street. Um, parking lots need to be behind the use, not in front of the building on the street. So you have buildings on the street, not parking lots. And there's also more window requirements. So that's just kind of a, an urban design consideration um, that we use to, to create better, better design with new development. Another important consideration about the about rezoning, whether it's this or really any other rezoning, is this idea of a, a non-conforming use. And um, basically what happens with non-conforming uses is a if you change the underlying zoning of a property and the existing use is no longer allowed by right, it's considered non-conforming. And there are um, restrictions on on the ability of that use to either be uh, expanded or rebuilt, um, enlarged or moved. You have to get special approval by the Board of Zoning Appeals to um, kind of do those actions. And there's also, um, you know, makes it harder for the for the owner to get like loans and that kind of thing um, from banks, generally speaking. So it's sometimes an issue and it's something that we want to be um, very aware and, and we want to make sure we understand and explain to people. Um, there are special considerations with each of the zoning districts regarding non-conforming uses. Some are more permitting to that than others. Um, here the, B, the B7 district, as I mentioned earlier, allows those M1 and M2 uses to continue to exist if they're already there those uses do not become non-conforming. They can continue to operate and be maintained and expand and, and be rebuilt in the case of a fire or active god, as it's called. So uh, that's a big benefit of the B7 district as far as existing uses go that might not be allowed otherwise. The B5 central business district that you know requires uh, fewer parking spaces for new projects but doesn't allow for as many of those lighter industrial uses. And um, if a um, if a use becomes non-conforming in the B5, it's technically non-conforming, but it can still be maintained and rebuilt and even expanded up to 10% without any special approval, even though it's technically non-conforming. The TOD1 district, um, doesn't really have any of those special considerations. Um, the use would just become non-conforming if it wasn't allowed by right. And you would need to get Board of Zoning Appeal approval for any um, alteration or expansion, but no more than 10% of the floor area. So that's a lot of information to digest. Uh, this is our timeline for the rezoning effort. We started off with a resolution of intent by the Planning Commission back in February, and that was just for them to say, yes, go ahead, start the process of, of talking to the community. This is our first meeting where we are tonight, March 18th. Um, we're going to have a public comment period that's going to run until March 29th. And we have our second meeting scheduled for April 13th with the public comment period running through the 26th. Um, so basically between now and then, we're gonna get all the feedback that we can and make a, a final proposal that we're gonna present at the April 13 meeting. And if everything goes um, smoothly, we will be in June introducing this proposal to rezone to Planning Commission and City Council for their final approval. 
but we need feedback. Um, we're going to uh, open this up for questions in just a second. Uh, folks can stay up to date about the rezoning at um, the city's rezoning website. We're going to be posting um, information for the next meeting there. Uh, you can find the meeting links there as well. We also have an online survey posted there that we're um, using to collect feedback on the rezoning. Uh, it's, a, it's a survey monkey. So surveymonkey.com slash r slash GSA rezoning. You can visit that at any time between now and the 29th <laughs> to give comment. And also uh, feel free to email me or call me. Um, answer any questions that you might have. Um, folks that are listening to recording, uh, pick up the phone or, or shoot me an email. We can talk more about this proposal. But for right now, um, people can either raise their hands and they'll be called upon, or they can even, I think, unmute themselves and, and ask a question. Hopefully that doesn't get too chaotic, but we'll kind of see what happens. We might also have some questions in the chat. So, um, Thanks, Will. Yeah. This is Marianne. I was going to quickly show the website just so you all can see. Um, this is what Will was referring to RVA Gov Planning and Development Review, front slash zone rezonings. If uh, Greater Scott's Editions right on top, uh, public engagement meetings. You'll see here the presentations already uploaded and the feedback survey um, where you can access. and. Um, go through that survey to let us know your thoughts on this. I will quit sharing. And I'm going to unmute the attendees. So if you want to raise your hand and answer and ask questions, but um, I know we have a couple in the chat. Our first question, uh, the northernmost portion of Arthur Ashe Boulevard is currently being developed for low intensity uses, a car wash and where I ideal idea like lease is a two story drive in set of shops already. The plan is being ignored. What is to be done? Will with the uh, proposed rezonings allow for these types of development? Yeah, um, in that situation, those types of uses would likely not be allowed. I, I don't I don't think at all um, any of those new uses would be allowed by right in these um, zoning categories. Um, I mean, this is kind of where we're at. The plan is only a couple months old, and this is um, really the first rezoning that we're doing as part of the implementation. Um, so yeah, some development projects have uh, come along under the old zoning and the old zoning is still there, so they're um, getting approved for it. Um, this changing the zoning will not allow for those kinds of lower intensity uses. It won't allow for gas stations, at least new ones to be built. And it, it'll kind of you know signal to developers, um, property owners that um, you know, the city envisions <clears throat> something different for this area. The uh, the the fact that the city owns so much land and a uh, an RFP to developers that the city will help um, craft and kind of mold that development that happens there on, on the city on land will really be a catalyst for the area and could really set the stage for future development. So, um, but you know, it might it might take a little bit of time to kind of move the needle um, and you know some some developers aren't imaginative and they there's an interchange there and they want to build a gas station and people will get off the highway there and they'll get gas and they'll get coffee and then they'll make money but in the future that's really not the highest and best use for um, these properties here right um there's a proposal somewhere in the process for an enormous rebuild of I-95 interchange. Has the city taken a position on this and is it considered in this plan? Right, so the do you city, know about that? Yeah, um, the city is involved. I, I don't know the exact answer to all of the details of the interchange, um, but I do know that VDOT and DPW are working on um, 
improving several interchanges and access along 95 through Richmond. Um, so we would hope that, I mean, we would like those to improve this area um, and getting on and off the highway from there and not be like detractors. And uh, do you expect the Greyhound terminal to move? Do you know anything about that, Maritza? So Greyhound is owned by a, a private entity. So the, the thing is, is you can rezone, but people can continue doing what they're like. We can't then make anyone do anything with their property. So Greyhound can do, I guess, what they want to do. I don't really know of any plans. I haven't heard of any plans for them to do anything other than what they're doing right now with their bus terminal. Um, yeah. uh, Jason, I see your hand raised if you want to unmute yourself and ask your question. Yes, um, thank you. So Maritza, um, thank you very much. I mean, first of all, I appreciate all the time and effort you guys have put into this. Um, and appreciate the vision for the boulevard here. We own some property across from the Wawa and, um, you know, it is it is tough because uh, when you look around today, uh, this is not greater, or it's not Scott's Edition proper, if you will, right? There's not um, a catalyst, if you will, for all of this growth that you guys are forecasting. And it is, like you mentioned earlier, not necessarily going to happen in a year or five years, maybe not even 20 years. So we do have to kind of recognize reality and work with what we have today. Um, you know, part of the challenge is there are some uses that the city will take away, such as, you know, drive through restaurants um, that are permitted in the M1 district. So the question is, uh, how can we kind of acknowledge what we have today? And once you flip a switch, you go from M1 to B7 or TOD overnight and um, you know, in some cases that may not reflect what perhaps the market wants, what businesses want, what neighbors want. It might be the correct long term vision, but to uh, change everything overnight, um, I don't think is necessarily fair, especially when you're taking away uses that are permitted today by right. Um, and I will tell you, since the pandemic hit, uh, we have had a lot of restaurants reach out to us, local and regional groups who said, look, you know, our customers want drive through. Uh, and since that is currently prohibited along uh, in the Scotts edition and Broad Street area, these are people that we're trying to serve uh, with the newly proposed shopping center Scotts Walk that we announced. We purchased the property last January over a year ago, well before um, the land use plan was finalized and accepted. So, um, you know, I would just like you guys to take that into consideration that it's, I agree with the long-term view, but we can't sit around and wait for five or 10 years to see if the market starts to accept this vision. So in fairness to the property owners today, it would be nice to have an option because quite frankly, I would choose not to opt in to the new zoning and stick with the M1 that we currently have versus see our rights taken away. Um, thank you for your comment, Jason. Um, I think I've heard Kevin Vonk, the acting director, um, say this a couple of times, and it is a it is a 20-year vision, um, and sometimes the steps have to be more incremental. Um, so, um, if you could, you know, fill out our survey and write your thoughts on what category you feel like would be more appropriate. Um, and the rezoning does need to have, um, I don't know what proportion, but a certain proportion of property owners are supposed to agree with it, I think. I don't know. We have to look at the rules on that. Um, so just so you know. Marianne, other questions? Yeah, um, oh. Ashley, if you want to unmute yourself or. Oh, before we go, can I chime in for just one second? Yeah. Um, I think one of the things, um, appreciate uh, the comment and yeah, just to kind of 
talk about the, the incremental nature of, you know, the future land use plan, I mean, is looking long term and the zoning as, um, you know, as mentioned, I mean, that's the tool that enables us to or enables a property owner to do particular things. Um, you know, and I think talking about, you know, how we get there, where's the market at in terms of and where is the community at in terms of what they're comfortable with by right and what things may be, you know, beyond that that we need to talk about a special use permit or conditional use permit. Uh, I think one of the things that we're trying to I've heard this concern from some council members is to have the balance of um, you know, zoning or rezoning one parcel and one property at a time, um, balance with then, okay, how does that fit into the greater context of, of the neighborhood and, and the area surrounding it? So I think with some of these uh, approaches that we're taking, you know, the city is, is looking at moving forward at, at rezoning um, its parcels. Um, I think there's been, as, as Bill showed, a number of special use permits in this area that show the use is changing. And so we are, um, you know, looking at kind of, I'll, I'll say, defining that neighborhood and where the lines are and what might be appropriate for rezoning categories. Um, I think it's it's pretty clear. I mean, this is our first attempt. I mean, in terms of we have to start somewhere. And so I, I, I do really appreciate that feedback to, um, you know, let us know both in terms of the zoning categories and then also you know the boundaries themselves i mean that's that's part of this process is to consider um you know what gets before ultimately planning commission and, and council ashley if you want to unmute yourself yes thank you uh and i'm ashley Pease, president of sour properties we own uh, a number of properties that are actually zoned M1, and we're in a little bit of a different position. We have uh, vacant and highly underutilized uh, land that could be redeveloped, and we're in a position uh, where we have su successfully redeveloped a portion of the property with the new Whole Foods Market, the Sour Center, with several Class A office properties, and we would love to implement the city's vision. Um, and we are technically, our property is in the Greater Scotts Addition Planning Area, um, but I, I'm not sure exactly where the boundary lines are for this rezoning initiative, but we would love to be included and we would love to implement um, sort of exactly what the Richmond 300 Master Plan has outlined for our properties. So if you have any opportunity to think about us, we're raising our hand. <laughs> and we would love to bring tax revenue to the city because it's all new construction. That's it. Great, thank you, Ashley. Um, and thank you for the work your Sowers has done to you know, reposition those properties along Broad Street. Um, I'll add. I think one follow up piece to that, um, I think part of what we have also discussed is, is there's a lot uh, of activity uh, on West Broad and in this area. Um, as many of you know, uh, we went through a process uh, of looking at uh, rezoning some properties to the south of this along Broad Street. Um, ultimately, the, that process um, was put on hold. Uh, but there still is an initiating resolution to to look at rezoning that area, primarily um, from from Arthur Ashe uh, eastward um, down towards uh, Center City, um, specifically around the, the museum and Alice and Pulse stops. Um, that is one thing that I've had some you know preliminary conversations on with some of the civic groups who represent the nearby neighborhoods. Um, and then also internally, you know, discussions about what is the appropriate zoning coming back. Um, my understanding, I think there was some consensus uh, about some of the properties in question, you know, north of Broad and, and moving towards, um, you know, more of a, a TOD um, type zoning uh, to facilitate that development. Um, but I think we also have been looking at, you know, the appropriate categories for, um, you know, the area south of Broad uh, as you move more towards in the residential neighborhoods. And do we have the zoning categories or the correct zoning categories in place to, to help um, you know, facilitate transit oriented development, but then also respect the residential neighborhoods that are there. Um, and so I think, you know, part of that is conversation is, is 
continuing to happen will be moving forward. And then Councilperson Addison, uh, I believe, just put in a request for us to look at basically west of um, the interstate back out to the, the boundary of, of the city and in kind of the same type of area. And so I think it's important for us to, you know, look at each of these individually, but in the same aspect, understand how they are tied together in an area that that is changing um, and make sure that as we go through, we, we do get the categories right and the zoning right, which really is, um, again, going to properly cover the, the land use. So I think um, you know, we'll definitely have some further conversations about what pieces move forward and, and at what pace. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, Jerome, if you want to unmute yourself. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to speak and I also appreciate you bringing this to the communities. Um, my, what, my concern is that when we talk about, you know, more people moving into the city, and I guess we're looking at Greater Scotts Edition as being part of the migration to the city, we haven't talked about, you know, the school process. I mean, where, what do you, what, how do we figure, how do we, how are we gonna factor that into an overload and as far as um, enrolling these kids in school if they just, if these are long-term residents? But also too, what my concern is the amount of traffic. I don't, I'm not hearing anything being talked about as far as traffic as it moves east and west throughout the city of Richmond. More so along the Pulse Line, going north and south along the Pulse Line. I, we're not talking about the traffic, the impact of traffic, as well as the delivery of, of basic services. How, I mean, I'm not sure how that's going to be impacted with this type of um, rezoning. I don't know thank if anyone wants to take comment. a stab at that. <laughs> yeah, thank you for your comment, Jerome. Um, part of the the proposed, you know, layout, and the city owns the the land. Most of the TOD one land um, includes creating more streets. Um, that will help uh, with with easing uh, the flow of traffic, having more of a grid rather than funneling everyone onto certain streets, full, uh, primarily. Um, also, the the plan envisions a you know supporting our pulse and and creating more transit options and biking and walking so that not everyone is always uh, getting in a car for all of their trips. Um, but also these um, I have to look at it. Some those V dot improvements that are planned um, are going to help with flow of traffic off of 95 and you know along the highway um, this is this is a pretty congested stretch of highway at, at times um, that's true um, but the way that we've designed the master plan is to try and um, design our transit transit network and our road infrastructure and our non car modes um, to really connect and support these nodes uh, to help it to help it make so that not everyone is always getting in a car for every trip all the time. As it relates to schools, um, yeah, if, if families move here, there might need to be a school. And I think in one of the plans we have a we have a spot where we talk about like a flexible a flexible space that could end up becoming a public use, and that 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 could be a school. Um, certainly, because um, if you think about this area, um, the, the children in their elementary school would, would probably go to Holton or Carver or Mumford or Fox. Um, and some of those schools are pretty over uh, subscribed, subscribed right now, too. Um, Andrew, if you'd like to unmute yourself. Sure. Um, thank you. My name is Andrew Basham. Um, my company, Spyrock, has developed uh, a number of projects in and around Scott's Edition, this greater Scott's Edition neighborhood. And <clears throat> Kevin, you, 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 I think you and your team have done a great job here. Um, harking back to Mark, Mark Oling, you're also participating in this exercise. We've been working on this for a long time. Um, I think it's a very uh, well vetted. Uh, plan. Um, you you guys have done a tremendous job in your public outreach and trying to incorporate comments from the neighborhood, 
um, and, and not only from our neighborhood, but from outside of our neighborhood as well. So um, uh, kudos to you all for doing that. And um, I, I would tell you that while the the, Scots, the greater Scots addition rezoning to B7 and TOD1, which um, I think was a was, an, was perhaps not um, uh, doesn't fall into the category of being part of this exercise because it was earlier uh, than the Richmond 300 master plan being approved is a is a good indicator of what um, this would do for the neighborhood. And if I'm not mistaken, Scott's addition proper is about 150 acres. Um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm putting my board hat on here. I'm on the board of the association. Some other members here, Rob Long, Matt Radji, Trevor Dickerson, our president, are on. Um, and I think they would agree with me that, you know, we were inundated with special use permit requests as a uh, as an association. And it really from that standpoint, took our eye and the city and the planning department's eyes off the ball with respect to focusing on some of the fundamentals like road infrastructure, uh, sidewalks, street trees, some of the other sort of critical planning elements that are important to creating these uh, successful neighborhoods. And when we, um, when, when, when the city was able to rezone uh, Scott's edition, you can see it shown on this plan in sort of the upper left-hand corner of this uh, of this um, aerial that's up to the B7 mixed-use district. It, it has allowed uh, not only us as an association, but property owners and the, the broader neighborhood to understand what in fact is allowed to be developed in the neighborhood um, uh, on every every piece of property, and it has taken a lot of the um, uh, I would say uncertainty out of the process, and I think that's been very valuable to us. It may not be perfect. Uh, we've certainly had challenges. Um, we're still working on infrastructure. We have roads issues. Jerome brought up schools. You know, the the, the more density we get, um, the more the more people that means, and it, it, we don't want to lose these people to the surrounding counties. We want them to stay. We want them to buy homes in these neighborhoods. We'll see more for sale um, development. I know that uh, our team is working on some for sale projects where it will be home ownership in this neighborhood, and um, and that will result in the demand for schools. So we need to think about that. We need to think about roads and traffic, um, and the and the Richmond 300 Master Plan does that. It, it contemplates all those things. Uh, and, the, and the zoning allows us and, uh, and the city to hold uh, the developers of these uh, properties to a standard that will improve, perhaps incrementally, those challenges and those aspects of um, these projects and these neighborhoods. So um, I think, you know, again, uh, we're, we're enthusiastic about this. I think our, our neighborhood association is in general. Um, enthusiastic about it, and um, uh, thank you for all the hard work you put in, and we'll certainly be responding to your survey and uh, participating in these processes moving forward. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, Jerome, I see your hands raised again. If you just want to mute yourself. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I guess my concern is that when we talk about, you know, the growth, if you will, uh, how it bumps up against other neighborhoods for the most part, because the traffic on, I mean, we, you know, we're looking at growth and development, but the traffic as far as not the main streets like the Pulse Carter or Pulse, if you will, but traffic, the, the traffic that's gone from Lee Street from East on Lee Street, how that, with all of that growth that's coming in, how it impacts the, 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 the smaller neighborhoods, if you will, such as Carver. And I mean, I'm going to say Jackson Ward, Although Jackson Ward is not as is, is a lot larger than Carver, but then you have Newtown Carver and Jackson Ward, where it actually makes the traffic a, a, a more difficult. I don't think everybody's coming into the city with bikes and car with um bikes and walking based on what we're building, if you will. They may stay in with inside of their neighborhood and they may have those destinations with inside of their neighborhood. But when it comes to things like moving to and fro from, let's say from um Kroger back to Scott's edition. The traffic is pretty heavy and then i think also too what we're looking at is that the more we develop the less we have an opportunity to um look at how 
the infrastructure is going to be impacted. We're not looking at that. I think we should spend more time looking at how the infrastructure is going to be impacted, not just around Scott's addition, Greater Scott's addition, but how it spills over into the other, other neighborhoods. Thank you, Jerome. You're yeah. welcome. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we think about, about traffic and we think about how people um, will be getting around. Um, that is definitely something that is that is on our mind as we um, are planning ahead. Uh, there was uh, something else I, I, I meant to ask uh, about. Uh, Kevin, I think Kevin Vonk was, I was in a meeting or we were in a community meeting with Kevin Vonk and we were talking about, and I keep hearing people say that when we go through these sub sorts of rezonings then we can talk about housing and things that we can ask developers to do. Well, and for some reason, I can't remember the term that was being used, whereas it was a legislative process in order to say that we have, we could demand or request that developers do certain things like affordable housing, if you will, that so much of a piece of property has to be affordable housing. Um, Kevin, can you, do you remember what, am I making this up or do you remember us having this conversation at another meeting? And if so, then with that being said, we're rezoning, but I think we might be rezoning on, on, on principles that might not be there, thinking that we can ask for certain things from developers. Sure. Um, no, I thank you, Jerome, for your comments. Um, I, I want to address all of them, and, and let me start with your, your previous comment, just to maybe follow up on, you know, traffic and, and movement. I will say that one is probably extremely tricky right now, given it's not a, a pure COVID reset, but I think you will see differing patterns in, you know, people primary, their mode of transportation, right, for basic things like going to school, going to work, and doing basic services. And I think, you know, the last year has taught us those things can be severely altered. Um, I don't think we're going to totally stay a 100% virtual society, but I think, you know, in terms of where people move and how people move, um, it's, it's, it's going to be different. And I, I, don't, I don't envy any, I, I guess, you know, traffic engineer that's trying to, you know, kind of dictate the, or understand where those patterns are, are going to be. Um, to to Maritza's point, I, I do think it is important. Um, it, it's really tough here because we've got 95, 64 and the railroad tracks that really, right, I mean, by their nature are hard to penetrate across um, and, and we have limited rooms for crossing and that is kind of shaping some of the, um, you know, traffic patterns. I think one of the things that we do look at is, okay, what we're doing in this area, are we allowing for different types of uses so that the market can maybe provide more services in this area and this neighborhood that individuals who are here don't have to travel as far um, oh, I forgot where it is, Maritza, but there's somewhere in, in Richmond, Toronto that talks about, right, being able to have, you know, a lot of services or things you need, you know, for 80% of your daily life really within, you know, kind of a 15 minute walk. And so I think that's one of the things that we look at as, as projects come through. Um, you know, how do we get those neighborhoods that are truly that mixed use to, to enable that movement within the neighborhood? As far as, um, you know, we talked about between um, you know, an administrative approval and a legislative approval. Um, one of the things that we're going through right now, and, and I think uh, Andrew talked about it, is, you know, what what is the certainty involved that if you rezone an area, what are the by right uses, right? There's a list of things that I can do by right in terms of if I follow the rules for, you know, setbacks and heights, um, and then the type of use, what are the things that I can go through and get an administrative approval. And, and that's what we're trying to decide, you know, kind of where to set that bar in terms of how much can you do, how big can you go, how dense can you be, how high, those types of things, what are by right? That if I come in, have a property, I can come through and get go through a process to apply for it, where really um, there's not a whole lot of public interaction because the community has said, yeah, we're, we're generally good with all the uses in this particular district. When you have a legislative process, and, and generally that's, you know, right now through conditional use permits or special use permits, uh, it involves, um, you know, a plan commission, city planning commission recommendation to city council. And within that, you can attach certain conditions um, to 
the approval. And I, I think one of the things um, you know we're working on right now, there, there are certain limitations in terms of like the conditions um, we can impose because they have to be directly related to the health, saf safety, and welfare of the adjacent property owners and the community. Um, the, the special use, you know, can move forward so long as it doesn't impact those things. And so the conditions you attach to it are, you know, specifically supposed to be related to minimizing, mitigating any impacts you may have on, on health, safety, welfare of, of the community. I, I will say that there, um, I think last year, the General Assembly passed some legislation that enables us um, to perhaps provide some more incentives for uh, affordable housing. Um, we don't necessarily have the tools right now to enforce it through inclusionary zoning, but if we as a city um, can provide additional pathways or incentives to allow developers to take advantage of that to provide more units, I think that is something that is positive. Um, and then also just in, in terms of also um, some discussions of what we might be able to do, um, even when there are you know administrative processes, are, is there still an appropriate way when we talk about perhaps a, a rezoning or a site plan um, to have better community conversations about larger projects or, or projects that have um, a, a way to have a bigger impact, maybe just beyond their immediate boundaries? I, I don't have a specific answer, you know, at this moment because it's it's something I think we're discussing and and learning about. But it's it's trying to have this balance of you know, providing some certainty for a property owner of what I can and can't do with my property. And if I go beyond that, what does that mean in terms of the conversation with, with the community? And so, um, you know, as we go through here, I think it's important, you know, to get these zoning categories right. And, and I will say, I mean, just as a whole aside, I mean, we are, you know, talking about how do we improve our zoning ordinance for the future overall to, to reflect the way we build now is, is very different than maybe we have in the past. It's, it's a lot more mixed in, in our uses. Um, but, you know, that's the balance we're trying to, to strive for is, is between, you know, the certainty that comes with the zoning and also respecting the impact that some of these developments may have on the adjacent communities. Um, Jerome, I want to just address a couple things is that I don't know if you were on when I was talking about the redevelopment of the city owned property, but um, the city owns about 60 acres. It's where the diamond is um, and the ballpark right above it. And um, when the city is selling its land, it can place a, a number of conditions on on the developer through the RFP process. And that that can include um, providing mixed income housing as part of the project. Um, and so the city is currently working on an equity scorecard to help evaluate um, public private uh, deals where the city's own selling land and kind of set some expectations for what uh, the community wants in return for the sale of that public land to a private developer um, beyond just cash for the land, but you know, cash and potentially um, affordable housing units, you know, a, a commitment to provide a certain percentage of the construction jobs to minority businesses, a commitment to um, to help support local businesses and minority businesses within the development after it's after it's implemented. Um, so those are all um, things that the city can do with its own land. I think what you were talking about is also is something called inclusionary zoning, which the um, the city isn't authorized uh, by General Assembly to uh, mandate inclusionary zoning. Inclusionary zoning is where you draw a line, you make a zoning district, and you, any projects in the zoning district will be required to create a certain number of affordable housing, a percentage of affordable housing units as a per, from their whole, um, and then the affordability is also defined within the zoning language. A big caveat to say is that a lot of units are not made inclusionary zoning does not create a lot of affordable housing units. It creates some, but it does not create a lot. When you look at other um, and cities across the country that are authorized to do inclusionary zoning. So you have to think of inclusionary zoning. You also have to think of how you sell city owned land and you know have some affordability requirements if they're doing residential. You have to think about how you fund and find dedicated funding for the affordable housing trust fund. 
you have to think about how we think about rezoning our residential neighborhoods to allow appropriately scaled, um, you know, nothing like out of control uh, improve density so that more people can live within those neighborhoods um, and the housing markets aren't so constrained um, by, by the residential zoning. So there's lots of pieces to help create more affordable housing and inclusionary zoning is one tool, um, but it's, it's, I was just reading an op-ed in the Washington Post that came out this weekend and they were talking about how it hadn't created that many housing units. So we have to really think about where the city owns land um, and also um, rezoning and kind of trying to find other ways to create more affordable housing opportunities. We have a couple questions in the chat. One is, is there a map that shows the portion of the land to be um, rezoned that the city owns? And that's kind of this map in the right corner that shows in pink, shows the publicly owned land. Um, question, if this rezoning occurs, it appears that a casino and nightclub re would require a CUP. Is that accurate? Yes, that is accurate. A CUP is required for any uh, uh, nightclub use. Um, the casino isn't a use listed within the zoning ordinance right now. Um, the, 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 just to be clear on this little diagram, um, not all of this land is owned by the city. Some of the land is owned by the state. So the city really owns um, the triangle piece between the two, the two big roads, the Richmond Technical Center, and where the Redskins training facility or the Washington sports team facility is. Thank you. Um, uh, where can I find a recording of this meeting? Um, Will, do you want to pull up that last slide that has all the links, um, some questions about that, and also where the survey is located? Um, will you be moving or incorporating sub roads into properties in your master plan? No, can you repeat the question? Will you be moving or incorporating sub roads into properties in your master plan? This could be some, I think we've drawn in some roads in some of the city owned properties that weren't aren't there currently um yes the vision is to create a grid a gridded network to break up the super block as it's called and planner world of the diamond and to introduce uh roads through the through that parcel I think, uh, Marianne, you're muted. I don't know if you're trying to speak or not. Darn, I was. I had a really good speech right then. If anyone is on the phone, if uh, you'd like to speak, press star six to unmute yourself. But I do see uh, Jason has his hand raised. Jason? All right. Okay, I was just given the opportunity to unmute. Yeah, I apologize. I did something wrong. No worries. Uh, I was thinking a little bit about um, Jerome's comment about people traveling to Kroger uh, and that contributing to traffic on Lee Street there. Uh, one thing, this, this is just a suggestion. I don't have any answers or any magic bullet here, but you know, uh, if we're going to increase the amount of residents in this neighborhood, we're going to need more retail services, right? And the problem is the a lot of the renderings and the pictures you guys show of this, you know, uh, these storefronts and street front commercial, they work for some businesses, not not for all. And if you look at uh, Broad Street today along the Scott's Edition corridor and what the BRT has done to it, there are some positive things, right? So it's it's more pedestrian friendly than it used to be. But you, um, the city has eliminated a lot of left hand turns all the way down. Broad Street from 195 to uh, the Boulevard and beyond. And so a lot of retailers and restaurants, you know, their business depends on ease of access and parking. And so I just ask you guys to think about that a little bit as zoning changes and also for the city owned property, you think about where do a lot of people go for their retail? They go to Willow Lawn, they go to the county. 
So the city loses those sales, if you will, as well as those retail businesses, because a lot of people just find it's easier to get there and to park and to get around. Um, I'm not saying that we want to build Willow Lawn here, but I do think that it's been a challenge. You look, there are a lot of vacancies along Broad Street in some of these newer projects that have been built. Uh, we've gained a lot of multifamily and housing units, but I think some of the retail struggled and a lot of the retailers that we see um, have actually found better located spots along Roseneath or Summit or other areas interior to Scott's Edition where the parking is a little bit easier to navigate. So it's just a suggestion that maybe we need to think a little bit about wayfinding and parking. And if parking isn't up on the main drag, how do people easily find it who aren't familiar with the neighborhood? And also, how do we allow certain retail uses and services that don't neatly fit beneath an apartment building to exist in a neighborhood so that people don't have to drive all the way down Lee Street, Lee Street to Kroger? Just a suggestion. Yeah, I think when we were kind of envisioning the framework plan and kind of talking about it with the community, we were thinking that um, there would be parking structures um, and that people, you know, they would be well signed and um, people would know where they are and they would park and like if they're going to the ballpark, they would park and stay for a while, like make a bigger trip and walk around and not like get back in their car and move around that way. Um, and the, the, there are examples, um, it's not a really common thing in Richmond, but there are examples of grocery stores on the ground floor of apartment buildings or condo buildings or office buildings. Um, when I lived in, when I worked in Old Town Alexandria, I worked in a building with the Trader Joe's on the ground floor. Um, and so that those uses can be incorporated into the fabric um, so I think like parking and making sure that there's very good wayfinding um, would be a, a very important element of any redevelopment of the city owned property. Great. Jerome. Just a quick question. Are there already ordinances in place that we should know about so that we can look at it and maybe get a better understanding or are the ordinance yet to be developed as far as the rezoning of Scott greatest of Scott's edition? This is our first meeting we've had. Um, there's no ordinance. There's no like leap. This is where basically what will happen is we're having this meeting. We have the survey out. We, we pitched out some ideas for rezoning and we want people to like react and respond to that. Um, you know, fill out our survey email will uh, call him if you're on the phone. His number is 804-646-6348. That's 646-6348. Um, and then after the kind of initial comment period, we're going to regroup, read everything that people said um, and kind of understand what tweaks we need to make to the rezoning. Um, come back to you all. We'll go to the other slide on April 13th. Um, and we'll have a kind of a revised version of this plan um, and we'll get comments on that revised version. Um, and then then we would start the um, drafting of ordinances, which would align with 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 the with the feedback we've received. Um, and we would present it to Planning Commission and Council. I think you do make the survey, um, not the survey itself, but the responses to the survey public no there it's always public yep okay. yep we will we will any survey that we do um we we post the results um you know usually even as an excel um so that you don't have to like if you want to sort things or analyze things it's easier um and we'll post it on our website that's up there um we usually we 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 delete the the names of the people who will post it um but before we before we post it online. Okay, thank you. We have a comment in the chat. Parking is the number one problem in Scott's edition currently. I think it would be a massive oversight not to include structured parking for the city owned parcel. Yeah, there will definitely be structured parking, especially since there's um, the ballpark uh, 
which will need structured parking, but yes. Again, if you're on the phone, star six to unmute yourself. If you don't know how to raise your hand and you want to speak, uh, you can click uh, to unmute yourself as well. Looks like we don't have any more questions or anyone else wanting to speak. Well, I guess we're ending three minutes early. Thank <laughs> you. Thank you, everyone. Um, again, the website, the links, and Will's information are all available to you. Thank you for joining. For Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you, guys.